All right, everyone, sit tight. We're going to try reconstructing pitch accent in ancient Greek. We're going to try adding that into our speech. I'm going to give you some practical advice for a plausible and pleasurable pitch accent, but the first half of this video is really going to be defending what we can know about pitch accent. Firstly, what's the reason why you would try to reconstruct a pitch accent? For me, it's trying to get to a truth about the ancient world or a closer and closer truth because I really care about what the ancient Greek language sounded like, but also because there is beauty in the pitch accent of the ancient Greek dialects where they would play with this sound. They would hear this sound as part of the words. If you were to listen to a pitch accent language today like Mandarin and someone had to reconstruct it without the pitch accents, it would sound super bare and like it had been robbed of some of its its zeal and its 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 power and melody. So I think that pitch accent is part of the language and part of the beauty of the language. But also on a practical level, pitch accent makes it way easier to observe syllable quantity. So there's these words: hemera, gardia, hemera. It's really hard to accent if you're only using a stress accent. You're forcing yourself to accent a short syllable among long syllables. He me ra, he me ra. That's really hard to do. Gardia. That's so hard. Whereas he me ra, it's like the 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 height of the pitch just does the work for you, and it can function independently of the length of the sounds around it. In it, to a certain extent, he me ra. And it also may help distinguish words that are otherwise hominins, so e versus e. That's going to be a little bit of a minor point. I'm mostly doing it because I like the beauty and because it interacts with syllable quantity in a really nice way. Pitch accent is too hard, they say. We have no idea what it sounded like. This is why this video is going to be super long, because I'm going to say, no, this, this is what we can know about pitch accent. Sit tight and enjoy. It's not too hard. 1.5 billion people today speak a tonal language, and it's throughout the globe, not just in Asia. I learned a pitch language, a tonal language, Mandarin when I was a child. I was growing up in Singapore. It's not too hard for them. So, and also you can, as a foreigner, you can get native-like proficiency in those things. So it's not too hard for us. Now, do we have no idea what it sounded like? The short answer is we have song melodies with consistent tonal patterns preserved in the musical notes. We have descriptions from ancient grammarians, and we can make realistic comparisons to modern tonal languages. So yes, we can't know 100%, but we know enough to make a pleasing and plausible experiment. And to make it plausible is you don't need to have everything absolutely nailed down. You just you want things to be practical, to sound good when you're performing, and to make it easier to observe syllable quantity. So I think that pitch accent is not too hard. It's actually going to make some aspects of your life easier. So the first step is we're going to choose a pronunciation. I'm choosing early coin air, 8050 learned coin air, because that's where I've actually had the most practice in. It's my area of uh, interest, but this would be just as good in Attic or Lucian. And you can convert my pronunciation into Attic or Lucian. If I say a word out loud, then you can copy me, but in your preferred dialect in with your preferred phonemes. These are all on a historical spectrum where they're all observing syllabic quantity and pitch accent together. Don't do this with Booth's Koine or later dialects because they have dropped syllable quantity and they've dropped pitch accent at the same time. They've replaced pitch accent with stress accent. And Booth, Booth's Koine system explicitly says like, no, no to pitch accent. It's a stress accent system, this one. So um, I'd, I'd respect that. And and uh, if you're doing modern Greek pronunciation, do it in modern Greek. Uh, that's 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 the matching thing. What about Erasmian though? Because Erasmian is not a historical. It doesn't belong to any period. So you can't say like it's inaccurate to do it this way or that way. It's just a, a language of convenience. Well, pitch is theoretically possible in Erasmian. You can you can overlay pitch onto like a set of sounds in Erasmian, even if it doesn't observe syllable quantity. But I think it would work 
best if you observed symbolable quantity. But in my opinion, I think if you're going to make the effort to do a pitch accent, you might as well take that little extra effort and convert Erasmian into one of the historical pronunciations, such as Attic or Lucian. There's lots of videos on how to convert Erasmian to Attic or Erasmian to Lucian at least. That would be well worth the investment. So now I'm going to continue in 8050 Learned Goiné. And here's a little crash course in rhythm and syllable quantity, just because I know that not everyone actually learns these rules, even though a lot of people get drilled into them, the rules of accent. I'm not going to talk about the rules of accent, but time in, in the Greek language is divided into more. This is a subdivision of the syllable. Every syllable either takes up one mora if it's a short syllable, or two more if it's a long syllable. Now, they can be long vowels and short vowels. Long vowels include a, e, i, o, u. Diphthongs are also long. I, e, o, i, u. Av, ev, ev, u. A, e, o. All of those are long sounds. And they will make any syllable that contains these long vowels also long. Then there's short vowels. A, e, i, o, u. And so long syllables contain a long vowel or they end in a consonant. And short syllables don't end in a consonant and contain a short vowel. Let me draw an example. Here I've divided up the syllables, making sure that the consonants belong to the right syllable. Unt is the first part of this and uh, the tr is going to be the start of the next syllable. It'll go untro, or omega is already a long one. Untro, bossestin. Boss is short because even though the word ends in a consonant, the syllable doesn't because the sigma is going to go to the next word which doesn't start with a consonant, estin. So, antro, possestin, short, estin, has sigma and tav, and that means that this, this syllable ends in a consonant, it's a closed syllable, so that makes it long by position, and then I don't really know what this syllable would be, because like, is the new going to go with another thing? If it goes with another thing, it's a short. So, um, the rhythm is... Antropocestin, antropocestin, antropocestin. And we're going to try to observe the rhythm while overlaying our pitch accents. There are a couple little extra factors, things like uh, uh, gr, 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 br. Blah. Those things are stop plus liquid. There are a few more examples of that, but certain consonant clusters are really smooth to say and can be counted as if they were just one consonant or can be counted as if they were two consonants. So I could have said ok loose and make it ok loose, but instead I've chosen to make it the short and make it o clus, o clus, so that the resulting sound, the resulting rhythm of this phrase is idon detus o clus, idon detus o clus. Corruption is another thing unique to Greek as opposed to Latin, where the final long vowel or a diphthong gets counted as a short when it's before a word starting with a vowel, as if one mora has been eaten up by the start of the next word. Or maybe that the ending sound of the, the ending of that vowel has become like a consonant sound at the start of the next word. In this case, it's makarioi. Makarioi normally has like a long oi. Oi is usually long at the end of words. There are some exceptions, but um, makarioi hoi. Hoi is starting with a vowel, so makarioyoi to koi to nev mati. 
That makes uh, a whole lot of shorts happen. Makari oi oi. Now let's see. We're into pitch accents. We're okay. We're looking at the accent marks now. There are three, maybe four accent marks in ancient Greek. Whether you count the unmarked or not, it makes it three or four. There's the acute, which is either high or rising. And then there's the circumflex, which is described as high, low, or falling. Or sometimes there's like rising, falling. I could represent it like this. There's like high, low, but um, I think it won't necessarily be helpful to think of it as low, high, low, low, high, low. Because I don't think there's enough time in the more for it to go to start at a low pitch, go up and then go down. I think that actually that is an illusion that it rises to the top one. And it actually just starts at the top and goes high, low. And, uh, and gives the impression of a low, high, low, high, low. Uh, next we have the graph. It's either a lack of accent or a lowered pitch. I'm inclined to say that it's a lack of accent and that the lowered pitch description is really lowered in respect of the graph only appears at the ends of words where an acute would have been at the end of that word, but because there's a word immediately following it, the acute has been turned into a graph. So relative to, you would have expected an acute there, it's been lowered down to neutral. I don't like to think of it as it's, a, it's lower than the neutral, like force it lower than the neutral. I'd say that this is neutral pitch. So gay has a graph marked here because it's in isolation, this word is gay, but here is gay anoixas. So that's where I'm, I'm just treating it as a neutral sound and the unmarked unmarks like this one uh, that would have maybe a lack of distinctive accent unless it's been pushed around by something else like the contour of the sentence or like an immediate acute before it will make it go down kind of thing. Stomma. Uh, things like that. Now, here is a way of simplifying these ideas, though. A circumflex is an acute in a different spot. Now, imagine that there is a long vowel that has been formed from two vowels because it has been contracted, for example. Like, it could be any vowel, not just alpha. If the second one was an acute, then it would have originally had this contour neutral high and it combines to become high or rising and that becomes an acute the result is an acute rise if its original components were high low because that goes acute and then a thing immediately after the acute is low high low then it goes circumflex high low that's a circumflex sound an example of that is noos, noos becomes noos, noos, noos. It's the same sound as an acute followed by a not acute but mushed into one vowel sound. That's that's a circumflex. Cross becomes cross, and that's an acute where it's like it was originally neutral and then high becomes rising cross and um so that's where these there's actually a lot less complexity behind this than you realize now here's where the pitch accent actually simplifies all these rules of accent i'm not going to say all the rules of accent i'll link in the description what the rules of accent are for when you want to know where an accent goes in a word but I'm assuming that you're reading from a text. But this helps explain why there are, like, what the rules are trying to achieve. What, what are they, why are they pushing the accent back or forth this way? In the case of accent where it's trying to go as far back as possible, recessive accent on verbs, for example, it's going to have this pattern. High, low neutral high low neutral 
the other thing that it could do is go high, low, continuing the low, neutral. The falling vowel after an acute can be too more a long. But in either case, you only allow one mora after the fallen vowel at most. This is where you're trying to push it, push the accent back as far on the word as you can. High, low, neutral, or high, low, neutral. And that's, that's our pattern. I'm going to show you how it works in all of these verbs. Legomen goes high, low, neutral. This is where it goes acute on the third last because it's, yeah, high, low, neutral, high, low, neutral, legomen. And this one goes legusin. It's high, low, low, gu, u, le, gu, u, sin. Le, gu, u, sin. The mora, the two mora in the middle are in the falling vowel, the fallen vowel. And that can be two mora long. It can have one mora after it, which is the neutral one after the fallen note. Now we've got ek lego, ek lego, neutral, high, low, neutral, ek lego. And this is where um, it's the same pattern as the top one, because if we try to make it acute on the ek, this is what's going to happen, ek, le, Go and you get the the illegal two more that are after the fallen syllable. So that's why this can't be allowed. You can't go ek lego. It's gotta be ek lego. Ek lego. So that's how this pattern's working. Now we have what about syllables that could possibly take a circumflex. Circumflexes, because they go high, low, can only exist on vowels that are two more long, long vowels. So um, in this case, we've got lu or men, it's gone neutral high, because that's what we're saying that an acute on a long vowel is neutral high or rising. Lu or men. Possibly it could be a held high. I'm, I'm, that's a possibility. Lu or men you or men and that one is observing our rule workers high low neutral just like lego men you or men it goes do, do, do. if we were to try to put a circumflex on the lu or men it would be like going ek lego if we're going lu, so it would fall on the same circumflex symbol uh, syllable, lu, and then it would go omen. It would have two more a after the fallen bit, and that's not right. Now we've got this word, lu. It's got a circumflex. It goes high, low, neutral, lu, lu, do, do. Better write that better. Do, do. That's um, where a circumflex, because it goes high low in that in those two more that it takes up, it can only be followed by one more mora. And that's why you can only have a short at most after a circumflex. And then we've got what about this? Lu Lu or that's like neutral high, or maybe high high, it could be a held high. Lu o, and that's following our pattern of high low neutral. Lu o, and that's why this has to be as far back as the accent can go if the word is like that. So you can see that the pragmatics of pitch and the the, the overall pattern of high low neutral is what's driving all of these weird long list of rules of where an accent's supposed to go if it's moving around. So now, halfway through the video, 
let's see if we can use musical transcriptions to check if our theory about like say acute is high and then you go down after an acute and like a circumflex is a falling pitch is that right we can use songs from the ancient world in general songs that native speakers are making are going to try to preserve the they're going to try to respect the pitch contour of the words that that they contain it won't necessarily be perfect like here's an imperfect example 祝你生日快乐 is the original contours of that phrase and in the song it's 祝你生日快乐 祝你生日快乐 it's happy birthday to you 祝你生日快乐 but you can see even though it's imperfect there are contours that are being respected here now what about this the Siculos epitaph this is not the only piece of music that we have from antiquity that's preserving pitch accent contours i want to show you that there are actually several songs by mesomedes such as this one and this one that's like 70 something bars long there is also fragments of Delphic hymns, several fragments. So even though I'm going to focus on the Siculos epitaph, that's not the only piece of evidence. It's not just eight bars that we're like basing an entire theory on. This song goes, Hosanzes, painu, meden holosilipu, prosolikones titosen. What can we say is it doing with the pitch contours here? It goes um, The first bar is weird. That one, I think is it's establishing the what the um, the chords, what the what the melody, what the key is. So I think that this phrase we should go hoson is is instead being made into like a declarative statement at the start, like hoson zes. Also, a lot of the performances that I have for zes uh, zes have it go falling slightly over the course of its three notes there, and that's I think because people know that there's a second flex there but it would fit melodically for it to go fall down to pino zes pino uh, so that is not necessarily an exception to circumflex equals fall but like besides those weirdness in the first bar it is remarkably matching a lot of what we're saying about how the tone is supposed to be red so an acute is high or rising tainu, tainu. that's high, that's rise rising that's rising oligon that's a li is higher than the surrounding notes dotelos that's telos is higher hokronos kro is higher so acute is either a higher syllable or a rising pinu. Notice that the the long vowel pi is made to rise. It's not going pinu like it starts on a high and falls. That would be circumflex. In the circumflex, we have other than the zes at the start, which is hard to read. We've got lipu and Zen. And we have Abaiti. I had to transpose that because I chose too low of a pitch. Lupu, uh, Zen, and Di all show falling contours. The grave and the unaccented don't seem to force the, the pitch up or down either way. But it seems to be a transitional note between wherever the musician wants it to be. Meden holo silupu. So the den in meden is actually allowed to rise. It's not forced to go down. But that's because the next note is higher than the previous one. It's like meden holos. The most important part is the holos. So it's 
it's not affecting necessarily the, the it's not making a big effect on the pitch contour but it's being affected by the pitch contour also we've noticed that after the acute there is a lowered pitch that go like la 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 pi nu nu is lower than the pi nu only gone the gone is lower than the li the loss the loss is lower than the te hokronos the nos is lower than the cro so that that confirms a lot of what we've been saying as the real contours of the pitch all right half an hour in let's try to associate a pitch contour with word identity we're going to say these words in different registers with different starting notes and the point is that they have a contour but you can transpose this and it will still be intelligible antropos antropos let me put my laser pointer up antropos now i can start high antropos or i could start low antropos or even lower antropos where i am doesn't matter so much as that it affects the contour like this antropos now let's try vasilevs 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 lower vasilevs higher Vasilevs. It doesn't matter what your starting note. You can you can play around with that. You can express many things. You can also make it more extreme or less extreme. Vasilevs is very subtle. Vasilevs is very unsubtle. You can play around with that too. Drakon. 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 Like you can make it more exaggerated, less exaggerated, higher, lower, but still observe Drakon. Hemera. This one's tricky because the syllable is a short one, but it's it's doable because we have pitch accent. Hemera. 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 What about Gardia? Gardia. 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 What about this one? Panta. 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 How about of tu? We've got a circumflex here. Of tu. The circumflex in slow motion is tu. Of tu. Of tu. Of tu. Of tu. Of do. Egenato. 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 So we can have a variety of expression even in a pitch system. Let's try saying these sentences in. I'm going to say some of them in fast motion and then in slow motion. En arche en hologos. En arche en hologos. I could even make the terracing a bit more more obvious, like in a en hologos. So I don't have to rise to the same height for each accent, but I could make parts of the sentence higher and then re-establish a new starting pitch and then go from there or make it make it lower, make it higher. In a en hologos. In a K in hologos. I can make some of them more exaggerated than others. If I want to emphasize a word, then I might want to bring out its accent more. Or not. In a K in hologos. Kai hologos in prostonteon. Kai hologos in prostonteon. Kai hologos in prostonteon. Well, that one was hard because we have a sentence where we want to emphasize a word that has a grab on it. Teos. Teos. The word was God. That is extremely surprising because we just said that the word was next to God, like near at God. And now we're saying the word was God. 
that that does your head in. And so that's why teos has been moved early in the sentence to really emphasize it. Teos in hologos. In that circumstance, this is where pragmatically we might want to say this graph shouldn't be a graph. We're going to put a pause after it, allow it to become an acute again. And, and I think that that would be a good strategy. This came from Randall Booth, who uses a stress accent system, not a pitch accent system. And his advice in this line specifically was turn that graph into an acute, make it a pause for dramatic effect. There, there can't be every single thing, every pause written in as punctuation. And punctuation itself is quite subjective. So it's up to the, the performer to decide whether there should be a pause somewhere or not. And I think that anyone with the brain on will probably put a pause here because of how surprising this sentence is. And the word was God. Gaiteos en hologos. And that means that with an acute there, we don't have to make the like the high point of this sentence, the ain, which just absolutely kind of seems to be the wrong word to emphasize. Gaiteos en hologos. Gaiteos en hologos. I'm still doing ain as a dropping tone. It's just dropping from a different point and it's not necessarily going like a giant jump up and then down. Gaiteos en hologos. And another example that I found in the Gospels is in the, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's another word that is got a grave accent. But pragmatically, in that sentence, this is the emphasized word. Blessed, who's blessed? The poor. That's un unexpected. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So that's, that's how we're going to apply it practically. Let's try putting it all together. I'm going to say in a casual kind of way what I might do with the accents here. Panta di avdu e gento. Kai koris avdu e gento u de hen. It's not perfect, but it's practical, it's plausible, and it, I think, is pleasurable. So I hope that that helps. And especially try practicing slowing down things in slow motion if you get stuck, like in our en hologos and then speed it up again and en hologos and you can you can get the identity of the word that way practice saying words in different registers but he lives like maybe that would be something like teon 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 depends on what word you find hard to accent and I hope that works. I also have some acknowledgements and further resources here. I wouldn't have been able to get this far in pitch accents without Luke Ranieri's video on pitch accents for his patrons. That one, it's behind a paywall, but you only need to pay like $1.50 or something. It's, it was pretty, pretty affordable. If you're into pitch accents, then probably that would take you further than this video. The other thing is completely free. Podium Arts, Ioannis Stratakis has a video where he does exercises on saying pitch accents in the last three syllables of words. He makes the graph go downwards in his exercises, but he's very good with his pronunciation, uh, an excellent one to follow and to imitate. Those are the resources I would point you to, and I hope that this has been a good start on pitch accents and uh, look into what they can sound like.